wanted to talk about this species uh, an introduction first. This species, black soldier fly, is a true fly and it is a member of the Diptera order. It is native to the southeastern United States. Most of you have seen it thinking maybe it's a mud wasp. It usually frequents around um, compost bins and uh, animal piles of poopy and uh, composting toilets. Those are the main areas people see them. They are completely harmless, unlike house flies. They don't carry germs, they don't bite, and uh, they're not vectors uh, for disease. And that's an important distinction between this species and the regular filth flies. And it's primarily because the adults don't feed. Um, they just, their purpose is just to reproduce. Um, this species, unlike most flies, has one of the widest digestive enzyme profiles insect in the animal kingdom. It can eat virtually all food waste, carbohydrates, nucleic acids. It eats basically everything we eat. Uh, are things like paper and cardboard and So Carl froze for a moment when he comes back. Um, so while he's gone, we, okay. So Carl, I don't know if you can hear me, but you froze for a moment. Maybe if you turn off your video, we can get some, a little bit better connection. All righty. Is it gonna stop the, the presentation? No, it, it, it no? shouldn't, okay. it should just, it just takes a lot of bandwidth to do the video. Bear with me. We should be able to still hear you, so don't mute yourself. I know. I'm trying to figure out there. Stop video. All right. Okay. And luckily, this species also is good at uh, reducing the population of the filth flies. And so it is quite beneficial in that respect. This video. This video is a time lapse and it's actually under one day. So this is how ravenous this species is when it comes to food waste. The one on the right is a cooked fish. The one on the left is a raw fish. So you can see the distinction. They will obviously eat both, but uh, cooked food and food waste that has been processed gets eaten a little bit quicker. So we're only at six hours. When you compare composting food waste that can take anywhere from six weeks, to three months, and compare it to the bioconversion capacity of this species, you can see why um, scientists are looking at this to reduce our food waste problem in America. And it's absolutely amazing when it comes to the speed. This is out of Switzerland, this video. And some of you may have seen it online before. I have put whole pieces in my unit in the morning and come back in the evening and it was gone. Gone, the entire pizza, even pizzas that aren't good. So Carl, Kelly has a question. How many flies did it take to eat that, the fish that fast? There's about 5,000. And these are the white cream things you see are the juveniles. Uh, they range in age, but that's about maybe 4,500 to 5,000. Any, any bin you have, uh, is going to get infested very easily with a huge population. Be each egg case is around 500 to 900 eggs. So it's very easy to hit that. Let's see here. So, and Marianne says, too bad they don't eat plastics. 
Oh my God, that would be wonderful. Um, Marianne, they do eat the biodegradable P uh, PLA plastics that you've seen that break down in your compost bin. We've thrown some of those into the bins and we couldn't find them. The, like the cups that we use at the museum? Yes, the PLA, the corn-based. Uh, yeah, um, awesome. We've looked for them, we can't find them. I, I, that doesn't mean some of the varieties won't get eaten, but the ones that we tried got eaten. And it could be that they are eating them or the, the digestive enzymes are breaking them down, either or, we're not actually sure. This is the life cycle species. This helps a lot for people to see. The egg cases hatch out in about four days. Growth is in the different stages of larva uh, in your bin. And then the one that you see in the top left, the dark colored one, that's what evacuate and crawl out instinctually of any active pile. And then that takes maybe, maybe one to two weeks to turn in and transform into adults. But that's the life cycle. And uh, it's distinguished from house flies in that the pupil stage is not a hard chrysalis and is kind of red colored in, in house flies. So that's the, the, def, the distinct difference. They're also larger. Um, this here is just a harvest I had in my yard. I wanted people to understand that undulation, it's a signature characteristic of the species. So you know you have it. If there is an erratic wiggle or an undulation that's very fast, it's a different species of fly, probably a house fly. These are very elegant in their wiggling and that's how you know you have them. Um, Bills because it has an enormous impact on the climate through methane production. So every bite of food waste we can divert from the landfill is a huge benefit for the climate. Um, the bioconversion rate of this species is 20%, which means 100 pounds of food waste translates to about 20 pounds of grubs, uh, which is pretty impressive. It has a high uh, nutrition profile, 42% uh, protein, 35 fat, Great for chickens because of the 5% calcium. Everybody knows the egg shells are necessary uh, to have structural integrity. Calcium helps with that. People feed them to all types of poultry, uh, all types of fish, and they take the undigested residue, which is the goop at the bottom of your pot, and you can feed it to worm bins. So the waste at the end of the year. Uh, the researchers are looking at using the fat in these to make uh, diesel fuel. Uh, in Europe, a lot of our systems are sold for human consumption of grubs, which is fascinating. And yes, they are delicious, but I don't recommend ever eating them raw. You have eaten them, Carl? Yeah, many times. We only we have potlucks where you can only bring insect dishes. That is amazing. So, you know, obviously Bug Fest, typically we have Cafe Insecta where we do feed people all kinds of insects. Um, and, you know, I'm always looking for new ideas. Wow, I don't think it gets better than that. Okay. Show people how much the chickens love fresh grubs and you get an idea. These here are bantam. They're a little obsessed, but you can tell they're not disliked. Now there's 5% calcium in this particular species of insect. So it's really good for the layers. Even little babies get excited. If you have chickens- and You don't have to give them much. Your chickens will like you because of these. like a treat in the morning, a treat in the afternoon. That noise they were making is because they were extremely happy. And you'll see as well, this is baby pigs, little piglets. Okay. 
being fed grubs. The protein really helps their growth spur. Okay, cultivation. The great thing is North Carolina is the perfect climate for growing these. You don't have to do it year round, just like tomatoes, you do it seasonally and your vegetable garden seasonally. Basically the warm months, April through October. Uh, we are in climate zone 7B to 8 here, so you can actually grow these as far north as Pennsylvania. Uh, they like it warm, they don't like it too hot, over 110 is not good, so Greenhouses in the summer are too hot, but um, in the winter, they're perfect. They do, one of the downsides with the species, they require sunlight, full spectrum light to mate and lay eggs, and which is why you can't do this in your basement. But if you can come up with a, a strategy to emulate the sunlight, you can do it. Uh, females are obviously attracted to the food web. to have as many um so carl we, we lost you we lost you for a minute there so you may need to back up just ah. so you have great egg laying and egg hatching at higher humidities lower humidity in the desert southwest it's not as robust so it really is perfect for our climate here um I always tell people, if you're gonna do this seasonally, just make more than you need and either freeze and dehydrate the rest so you have them over the winter. If you wanna store the live grubs, uh, wine cooler temperatures, 50 to 60 degrees is perfect. Um, again, take the compost that's produced and throw it in your worm bin or throw it in your compost bin for uh, finishing off so that there's no waste. I uh, don't wanna be in full sun, they wanna be in shade. So Carl, um, we have a, another question from the chat. Skelly wants to know, how much does it cost for a pound of grubs? Um, let's see, there's 25, 2,550 grubs in a pound of, of pre-pupa, so the dark colored ones. Um, how much for a pound of grubs depends on uh, if they're live, if they're dehydrated or freeze dried. And um, I've seen them range from a few dollars dried, maybe five to six, to um, 30 or 40 live. So they're expensive as live. All live feed is expensive because it's just more mm -hmm. delicate. Um, there's very few growers here in North Carolina making these. So the people who are growing them tend to be growing them themselves, uh, which is easy. Uh, so he says he loves that you knew how many grubs in a pound off the top of your head. I counted once. I just decided to count. Miranda has done that for us for um, crickets and mealworms. This so is we my... also know how we, I think we do it by cup, but yes. <laughs> oh, awesome. This is my bowl of cereal. After I was done, I poured some um, coffee grounds and grubs from the bin. This is growing in coffee ground. And uh, I wanted people to see a close up of it. Let's see here. Here's a video of my pod. This is my backyard. In full shade. That's my pod. Virtual shade. We Here's make these in Pittsburgh. For a scrub bait. There's a bucket that collects the grubs. Someone harvested off since I dumped it. Here is my makeshift lid because my area is not protected from rain. I just added these a few hours ago. They're just discarded bread. You can see the grubs climbing up the ramp. So we take all of the food waste that can't go to the needy from the food bank. I'm prepping for chickens. And that 
in that pod was the food waste from the food bank so it doesn't go to the landfill. And every Wednesday we drive around picking up food waste uh, at the supermarkets and feed it right to pods. And it's mm -hmm. a good cause because we also pick up uh, food donations and uh, send that to the food pantry here in uh, uh, Wake Forest. So Kelly wants to know, will they eat coffee grounds? Yes. In fact, uh, they're the best substrate. I highly recommend using your coffee grounds as a substrate as long as you keep them moist. What you don't want to ever do is let them dry out. Um, they are good for odor control. They are good for serving as a refuge for when they've eaten every morsel of food and have nowhere left to hide. And they help with moisture balance. So it's critical uh, that you have a substrate. Brewer grains from breweries for beer making also works fine. Uh, either one of those, a great, a great smell and odor control. Um, you don't want to feed them anything more than they're going to eat in one to two days uh, or you're going to produce odor. They eat so fast, they eat faster than the odor producing microbes. So you just want to make sure they continue to do that. And if they don't, you're going to develop smell. Um, never let the liquids back up in any type of pod or device that you're using to grow them because it'll cause stink. Um, as I had mentioned earlier, as they grow, they change color and that's what ends up crawling off is the dark colored one. Um, you can help put them in your hands because they no longer have mouth parts and they're very safe. And um, like I said earlier, they don't feed as pupa and don't feed as adults, though the adults do make water uh, to stay hydrated. Um, as you saw in some of the buckets, the grubs are very easy to transport. They're dry and they're relatively clean and uh, uncontaminated. And they're really um, easy to just store for a few days if you have to in a bucket. It's just a great species to do so. And um, that's another real benefit that I like. So Marianne has a question. Will they live in a compost bin with worms? Um, their digestive enzyme processing is so exothermic that they heat the bins up too high for the worms to be comfortable and make it uh, too hot. So people have tried to develop systems that had worms and grubs at the same time and it doesn't work because the temperatures get too hot, even when it's layered. So you will find almost all worm bins infested with um, grubs as long as the population doesn't get too high, it should be okay. They are completely compatible. It's just the temperature issue. They eat a lot of what the red worms and earthworms. I feel like I should do it. Oh, so Carl, we lost you again for a second, so maybe back up one sentence. Um, so the temperature differential yeah. is the big issue for compatibility. They can't really, the, temp, the worm can't handle the, cold, the, the hot temperatures. That's really, really, really fascinating. Um, okay, Kelly has a question. What if yeah. regular fly larvae get in the bin? Um, there are natural chemicals or microbes, soldier flies, that crowd out, inhibit, and dissuade the other species from growing. And they actually have studied the effluent from black soldier flies as a means of controlling the filth flies. So you really don't see flies after the first week or two of setup for the rest of the year you only see the black soldier flies. They just inhibit all the others, which is a real benefit. So Taylor is asking, so there is a chance that it can live harmoniously with other bugs. I have not seen any incompatibilities with other species other than crowding out other flies. 
they don't seem to have um, any problems with most other beneficial insects that I'm aware of. So it doesn't hurt doesn't hurt the pollinators in your garden. Um, I assume that the predators of other insects like birds and frogs will eat black soldier fly just like they eat other insects. So they, they can get eaten just like other species. Yeah, I would imagine that is, uh, uh, if you don't keep your bin the, covered, it's like a bird buffet. Here is the pod. Here's another. At my house. Did we see this one? No. So this one, they had eaten all the food waste. That is the coffee grounds that they hide in. They don't like light, Kari. So the after about is coffee grounds, 20 seconds, they'll bore back in and hide. Put the food scraps on top. You can see them disappearing already. And they devour them about 24 hours. It's pretty impressive. Anyway, I just want to be active pod in the summertime. So Carl, is this, it looks like that's more coffee grounds, but unless you drink a lot of coffee. So do you get your coffee grounds from, you know, like, like a local uh, coffee shop or something like that? There are several coffee shops locally. I bring a five gallon bucket and they fill it up and I take them. So I'm, I'm taking the waste that would normally go to the landfill. So I have a question. So what do they, so I am assuming, you know, they're eating all this. They're also probably pooping, right? And so is that, you know, because you're talking about the bioconversion. So what do you do with the, with the, with the, I guess the compost they produce? Is that just Great question. the garden? So the undigested residue at the bottom of any device you're growing them in is a combination of castings or poop, a combination of what they don't eat and also uh, their exoskeleton. So all of that's mixed together in something that can either be fed to redworms or needs to be added to the compost pile for finishing. It is not compost and it is not to be used in the garden immediately. You have to um, finish it off either through redworms or composting. But those three things are mixed together. There's no way to extract the castings out of that, uh, the other stuff. It's all together. So I've got a couple more questions. I wanted to um, show people hold on one harvest second. from okay. the pot. There's quite a bit of grubs in there, several pounds. Um, these auto harvest out of the unit automatically, and uh, you don't have to spray it. It's a real time saver. And uh, just wanted to show people. Uh, I think bounty. that's the best feature of this species is uh, the fact that you don't have to separate it out of your food waste like redworms. They just crawl out and you collect them in a bucket. That's incredible. I mean, that's so convenient. Uh, let's go to the next question, Kari. Um, yeah, so Kaya wants to know, where do the adult flies go when they're grown? Um, they tend to be in the forest canopy. They're very short lived. They rarely live over two weeks and their primary function as adults is just to breed and mate. Um, they usually mate within a day or two of hatching and lay eggs in a few days after that, and then they die. They uh, really don't have much else of a purpose. The reason people don't see these everywhere is they don't live very long. And uh, And uh, Skelly says that he used to work at a coffee shop and they would bag up the grounds for customers to take to their compost. Um, awesome. Yeah. Yeah, it, maybe in the future for climate change, it'll be illegal to throw food waste and coffee grounds away. It is, um, yeah, we took a landfill tour at the museum and it was, I put this in the chat, had but I just wanted to mention it. It was really, it, I feel like for all of us that went on this tour, it altered our entire life, our whole perspective. Um, so the landfill is wow. anaerobic. And so 
things break down so slowly. One of the examples we got on our tour, she pulled out a banana peel from the 80s and it was still a banana peel, right? And so like the, the, the breakdown process is so slow. So it makes you just not want to send a single thing <laughs> to the landfill that could possibly, um, you know, uh, compost naturally. So that's why at the museum we're doing compost programs and my programs like with the black soldier flies that yes, I, it sh I would love for it to be illegal to send anything compostable to the landfill. It, it's one of the highest impacts individuals have on the climate is food waste going to the landfill. So it does make a huge difference. Um, this here is just a close up of our patented technology and the ramps. So they crawl up these ramps and fall down the chute and they just go in the bucket and you have to do nothing. It's so much fun. My friend Jacob uh, helped me film this because he had uh, like this little adapter on his camera to get close up. They're adorable. Um, so Jerry has a question. So a large amount of grubs just showed up in his compost bin two years ago, but he hasn't seen them since. So how does he reinstate them? Uh, get more food waste and uh, don't bury it and they'll appear. Um, and then uh, Taylor had a question, where does he get uh, the black soldier fly grubs? You don't have to get them anywhere. They'll, they'll find you, the native here. So you just have to um, introduce uh, the environment that is conducive for their appearance and growth and they will show up if you just want to get a mason jar and uh, mix it with some moist coffee grounds and some pet kibble that you soaked for, I don't know, half an hour to swell up. And then the, a little bit of uh, just tissue uh, to prevent um, drying out and put it in the shade, they'll, they'll find it. Oh yeah, they will find it. But that's just a quick way of doing it for fun. The, the coffee grounds don't seem to be as interesting to house flies, which is why I always recommend it on setup. Um, obviously the house flies will like food waste just like black soldier flies. They don't tend to like coffee. So Kelly says these are like wonder flies. Yeah, all right, they should be renamed. Uh, I. I uh, wanted to say just a th shout out to thank you for Julia to patient with me and having all these devices all over our house. This is our four foot. This is what we manufacture in Pittsburgh, which is in Chatham County. So our factory is in North Carolina. Bio conversion rate is about 20% mixed food waste. You'll also see a brilliant addition to this generation of pods. We call the top grub barrier lip prevents them from escaping. Eventually they find the ramps and the mature ones which are black in color crawl up and eventually fall out the harvest chute and we have a collection bucket below. Mm. You could utilize this in any farm setting for fish, chicken, or so, Kari, the reason I wanted people to see this video here was this barrier here up top, this white thing. If you're going to do this at home with a do-it-yourself kit, just make sure you have a barrier that doesn't let them crawl out because once the sides of your bin get moist, they can crawl vertically and escape. So you want to prevent that, and our mm -hmm. device does that with this lip. But I just wanted people to realize they can crawl vertically on very moist conditions. Oh, I'm so sorry. So, so Kelly wants to know, how do you get, how do you get one of the bins? Um, we have a special price that is just for people uh, from uh, Bugfest and from the museum that is uh, below the retail. She can contact me um, uh, directly through my email. I can't disclose it on the video because this is going to be a, a public video and my resellers would send angry letters to me if we start discounting them illegally. 
my resellers are the, the retailers that sell these. And when we sell direct, they get jealous. So especially when it's discounted. So just contact me offline and I'll tell you the, the special price for attendees. This here is just an example of how fast they eat food waste again. This is also under 24 hours. It's so interesting how they are, how it moves around. You don't notice that unless you watch the time lapse. It's very hard to see because it's occurring so slowly. I will say this, if you're going to do this by yourself in a do-it-yourself bin, be very careful of bins that have corners because they tend to conglomerate in the corners and pile up like the zombies on World War Z and they'll pile up to where they build it up so high they'll actually overflow. So corners are not good. So you want- it, you to, it reminds me of like water currents. It's crazy. Um, here's our device. I just thought I'd put a picture of what they look like. This is the four foot unit in the bottom corner and the little baby pod is the top one. I put some labels on there so people knew what the parts were. Um, today, just coincidentally, I'm going to drive down to the factory and pick up another shipment. So um, anyway, there's my contact information. It just happens coincidentally that we're located here in the triangle and yet we ship these all over the world. <clears throat> so, I, so I think it's so fascinating. So you don't have to stock your bins. You literally just make the conditions appropriate and they come to you. That is, I do agree with Kelly. Those are wonder flies. It's amazing. While we have some more time, Kari, do you want to see if there's any additional questions? Yes, I do. Actually, um, uh, we have one from a friend saying, can you use these um, in your compost to help break down your food and other items in your bin? So in your, I guess in your regular compost. Yes, you can. Uh, if you expose the food waste, they will come. If the food waste is buried a few inches below, it's difficult for them to find it. Um, because you're uh, suppressing the odor of the food waste. But if you expose the food waste, they'll come. And Marianne wants to know, why should we do this? Well, the best reason to do it is to offset your feed costs for your animals. So you don't have to go buy as much feed for your chickens, your fish, your pet reptiles. And then the other benefit is to help offset the climate impacts associated with our food waste. And it's fun. So really that's a third benefit. Um, it keeps you from watching TV as much. So that's a fourth benefit. <laughs> Not as much screen time because you're doing, the, doing all the worm watching or grub yeah. watching. Believe it or not, it's one of those hobbies that uh, forces you to slow down, kind of like gardening. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. So, we, so um, I have a question just very practically. So if they're only, you know, they, they're, there's a certain ambient temperature that they like. So in the winter time here in North Carolina, would you just kind of set your bin aside for the winter and then kind of repopulate it when it warms up in the spring? I do set aside in the winter, usually around Thanksgiving, I empty the, comp, the undigested residue into my compost bin. I usually turn it upside down and then I take a, you know, just a hose and spray it so it's a little clean. And I just stow it away till uh, usually March is when I start to uh, get things out. I think it seems, um, it actually sounds so much easier than worms. I feel, you know, my mom has worms and the Freds, that's their name. And they, you know, they have to be in the garage, you know, they're very particular. <laughs> um, um, I think worms are more delicate overall with their environmental parameters, but um, they're easy if you don't have an interest in separating them out from the waste. That is a real challenge. Um, I have worm bins and I use just a six foot cattle trough that's about waist high. I just drill some holes in it for drainage and I feed them moist cardboard with a little bit of grit for digestion. 
scientific purposes, which is just play sand. And you can get worms just living off shredded cardboard. And we all have shredded cardboard. Anybody who doesn't have leftover boxes is not being honest with us because everybody does. And it's a great way to get that segment of your waste stream to the landfill as well. And worm bins can be brought indoors in the winter because they don't have wings. Unlike black soldier fly, I would not recommend ever bringing them indoors. Yeah. Um, and then Jerry says, all of his food waste goes into the compost bin, but he still hasn't seen any grubs for two years. Oh, no. Um, tell Jerry to send me a picture of his compost bin. Okay. <laughs> so and I'll try to, trouble, I'll try to troubleshoot it. Um, and Kelly it, says it, so it seems like you need both black soldier flies and worms. <laughs> Kelly, you're correct. It, it helps to have both. And if you want to have a holistic approach to your waste stream um, problem. All right. So we'll maybe give another minute or so to see if anybody has any further questions. Um, in the meantime, Carl, thank you so much for uh, this presentation. I've heard you, <laughs> now Kelly says she needs to get some chickens. Chickens are great. They're, They're very rewarding, what, especially they when they have babies. They, um, I have chickens and they are, they're full of joy. <laughs> I feel like they get more out of life than any pet I've ever had. They, this, they enjoy the simple things, bugs, dusting, the sun. So, they really um, do. I, I feel like, you know, I feel like, you know, if we could be more like chickens, um, <laughs> the world would be a better place. All right. So the Wassum family said, thank you. They learned so much today and they're going to start reducing their waste immediately. So I feel like our job here is done. <laughs> so, um, so Carl, if you can uh, stop sharing your screen for a second, I'm going to pop one up of my own. How is that good? Um, yes, that is good. And uh, so, um, of course, we can't have Bug Fest without our annual Bug Fest t-shirt. Um, so, you know, if you do want to get a shirt, you can get it at bugfest.org, or you can join a Renew Your Museum membership. You get one for free. Um, if you liked the program, um, please feel free to donate to the museum. We could definitely use those at this time. Um, and... Thank you so much. We are only in day two of a six day bug fest. So check out bugfest.org if there's any more programs you may wanna participate in. And if you have any questions, feel free to email Carl or I. And have a great rest of your buggy day.